Super Metroid, the 1994 Super Nintendo classic that helped lead the charge in developing what would come to be known as the Metroidvania genre of video game. People are very familiar with the game, and everyone and their mother has made a video on it. So while I am likely adding on to the pile of Super Metroid videos, I wanted to explore why I think Super Metroid is an incredible experience as a game, a thriller, and what makes it so thrilling to play through. The last Metroid is in captivity. The galaxy is at peace. Super Metroid begins with narration from its amazing protagonist Samus Aran. She revisits her previous adventures and states that after her fight against the space pirates and their leader, Mother Brain, on planet Zeebs, she journeyed to the Metroid homeworld SR388 to exterminate the dangerous organisms for good and prevent them from potentially destroying galactic civilization. However, she would leave a recently hatched larva alive due to its inability to harm and would deliver it to the Galactic Research Station on Ceres for study particularly of its energy-producing characteristics. The scientists quickly discovered just how beneficial the powers of a Metroid could be for civilization. But almost as quickly as they had made these discoveries, disaster struck. Just as Samus was leaving to hunt for a new bounty, she picked up a distress signal from the station. Something has gone horribly wrong. Samus enters the space station and cautiously heads down this long vertical shaft that leads us into the research facility. It's eerily quiet, with only machine beeps and a heavy ventilation to accompany us as we make our way through. After rooms of horizontal and vertical progression that are nicely provided with stairs, we finally reach the laboratory. The scientists have been killed and now lay within their own blood upon the ground. The last remaining Metroid has been captured, forcibly removed from its capsule. Samus continues on in this bleak environment and eventually reaches a silent, dead-end room where she finds the Metroid on the ground alone. But that quiet loneliness lasts only for a short while, before a draconic monster appears. Ridley. Accompanying Ridley is his banger theme that sets the mood for this confrontation. Jump, aim your arm cannon, and shoot Ridley in the face. Or technically just take damage until he leaves, was the Metroid and starts the self-destruct sequence of the space station Ceres. One minute. A single tense minute is all you have to escape from the station before it explodes. A common situation in the Metroid franchise. The only change between traversing the area before and now is that there is some steam being released that stuns you for a little bit and a vertical shaft back where we entered is tilting to the right. Considering this is only chapter 1 of the video, Samus clearly makes an escape. We watch the station explode and Samus and her ship speeds off to find the Metroid, Ridley, and the rest of the space pirates, leading her to land back on planet Zeeves. Zebes is a large and diverse planet for Samus to travel through for the rest of the game, with five core sections and a final area for the end of the game. Each is incredibly expansive, both vertically and horizontally, and the first of which is Criteria, where Samus lands to begin her mission. 
Kurteria's music starts off very airy and mysterious, but changes once the space pirates emerge to a more tense and sinister tone. It's visually themed in dark dirt and patchy grass due to its surface location, becoming more and more mechanical further down. Criteria is a testing ground for the player, opening up as you gain more and more abilities to use. Continuing from that thought, it also helps train the player for how to engage with the game. As an example, an early area is clearly inaccessible, requiring the use of the Morph Ball, an ability you obtain soon after and in returning back to this area that you hopefully notice when coming in, you can now pass through the small closed off path. This design helps keep the player engaged as much as possible for those potential occurrences, but also makes the game so thrilling to play through when the game's tone twists and turns while it maximizes that engagement. Brinstar is primarily characterized by life, as each of the biomes have a variety of set pieces like flowers or large tooth creatures. It's also buried in the color department, green jungle, pinkish forest, a blue cave, red stone with monsters in the ground, and a light blue with some white. The paths in Bridgestar are also pretty hazardous as a whole, alongside more dynamic enemies than just the slicer-like enemies that appeared in the underground of Criteria. These varied dynamics result in the player having to make clear adaptations to survive and make it through effectively. A lot of the design of Brinstar and moving forward also rewards a more experienced player. The utility of the wand jump, for instance, can give you access to a variety of items that would normally be unobtainable when you first come through the main portion of Brinstar. The wrecked ship is the opposite of Brinstar regarding visual aesthetics, as instead of the varied color environments, it's all the same. It's the space pirate ship that has crashed on Zeebs after the introduction. When you first enter the ship, the lights are off, establishing this mysterious and tense atmosphere to the ship. Plus, the ghosts make you understand that it's haunted as fuck. Afterwards, the ship's electricity turns back on, allowing you to access the entirety of the ship, including conveyor belts on the ground with robots and water-filled areas, a substance you have to avoid when getting to the ship in the first place. Given all the faulty wiring, it's amazing this ship works at all, plus all the spike hazards. Entering Meridia is extremely interesting because it requires you to power bomb a glass protected pathway between the two areas of Brinstar. Meridia is built of three types of areas its underwater area filled with various life, its swamp like savanna with endless sand, and its purple colored pipe filled area, which is frozen and almost factory like. Meridia requires more precise utility of your jumps and unlockable abilities to make it through. The other areas tend to separate their horizontal and vertical sections between rooms, where here they are mixed together more often. One room in particular is quite open in its design, very long and very tall with various parts to interact with using Samus' abilities and multiple different directions that can be taken. Norfair's visual theme is a mix between a cavern, a castle, and ruins, all with a draconic flair. There's also this mini section of bubbles that kind of reminds me of substances found in a witch's cauldron. One of the most important parts of this area's character is the hazards involved. First you'll experience heat that takes down Samus' health, then lava, which cuts it down faster and eas easy to get stuck in, and lastly this acidic substance. So while later you'll have the equipment to deal with these hazards, besides the acid, Norfair already sets itself up as intimidating for the player, as existing in this area will inherently bring harm. The music of Norfair also really helps elevate that intimidation factor, especially with the change to lower Norfair's theme. It's creepy and seems to constantly build this tension like something is coming. When in a way you're not sure, but it definitely is. The protagonist of the Metroid franchise is bounty hunter Samus Aran. She is quite powerful in her own right, but especially by the end of the game. Her basic abilities, besides her most basic movement, is running, 
jumping, shooting in various directions, taking damage more than twice, wall jumping, which you can do when you jump with a spin into a wall, and arguably most importantly, she can moonwalk. Yeah, and it actually lets you do something really cool. Opening the Samus status menu initially brings up a bunch of empty spaces. These are the unlockable abilities you'll be able to obtain. Also, the top part of the screen is designed in a very similar way with its empty space. Samus can attain other avenues of attack as well, like missiles, super missiles, bombs, and power bombs. The bombs can also alert you to what can be destroyed if not already within a room. Your normal shots can be upgraded, these shots can appear into ice, can pass through walls, and with the ability to charge up. There's also a variety of movement based abilities Samus gains like the famous Morph Ball, High Jump, Speed Booster, Grapple Beam, and Space Jump. Not to mention upgrades to those tools like the Spring Ball, allowing you to jump while in Morph Ball form, and the Screw Attack, which makes Space Jump do incredible damage that can destroy various breakable structures. On top of all that, there's the suit upgrades like the Varia Suit, cutting damage by half and giving heat defense. Then the Gravity Suit, which cuts damage even further and lets you easily get through water rather than the alternative. And lastly, there's the X-Ray Scope, letting you see hidden breakable blocks and passages and reserve tanks, which I hope are self-explanatory. So why did I spend so much time going over Samus' unlockable? Options! Samus has so many options and potential avenues of approach to engage with the environment of the game. You have a lot of freedom while playing as Samus and you can do so, so much. I think that fighting enemies and making your way through the game is incredibly engaging because of that control and freedom you have. Another aspect that makes the utilization of Samus so interesting and engaging is the limitations. Your health is limited, your missiles, super missiles, power bombs can run out, which to be fair likely will only happen during boss fights. You have to actively work with those restrictions and the potential tension and anxiety that can come from lacking those resources. Especially health, because dying sets you back to your most recent save. So if you haven't saved in a while, it can be really stressful upping that level of engagement with the game. And everything in this game becomes more tense and maybe a little scary. The thriller moments can get a bigger response from the player in those scenarios. All in all, playing as Samus is fantastic. Kraid is an extremely large monster to encounter. Before getting to the boss himself, the ground is layered with spikes and as Kraid continues to rise you see spikes on the top of the room as well. The only way to reach Kraid are the platforms floating in the middle of the room. Unfortunately, getting to Kraid is not quite easy. His main attacking tools is a swipe with his claws his projectile fingers bouncing around the screen like the DVD logo on your CRT. And lastly, he shoots giant spiky shards out of his holes from his body. Real grotesque stuff. So what can Samus do against this overwhelming threat? Well, your main tools of attack is a charged shot or missile specifically aimed at his open mouth. It's a tense fight, particularly enhanced by music threat of falling and Kraid's noises, but he goes down like any other.
Fantoon is quite strange. If the giant single eye and ginormous brain weren't enough of a hint. The room of the fight is very small and restrictive, especially given the boss's ability. Fantoon primarily exists in acts without a solid form, meaning you can't hit it most of the time with charge shots and missiles. When it does pop up, it can damage you if you reside in the same spot. Fantoon's main form of attack is the use of lifelike fire that can bounce around to hamper your movement. Although it does give some health if you shoot at it. The fight against Fantoon is a waiting game. Waiting for them to become visible, waiting for them to stop phasing, and waiting for the right position that you can capitalize on. Drawing out the fight results in an ongoing tension that builds more and more as the fight goes on and you come closer and closer to death. Upon entering the boss's room, you should notice gun turrets spinning out green electric balls from the sides. You can destroy them with missiles revealing a visible electric current. Then from the left side will appear baby versions of the boss. You can't deal any damage to them, but upon them leaving the screen, Dragon appear. Dragon's main attacks are attacking you with its tail and arms, firing sticky balls that slow you down, and a grabbing attack. Their weak point is the yellow belly on their stomach. However, the best and easiest form of dealing damage involves the visible electricity from earlier. Once grabbed, Dragon will bring you close to the wall, where you can attach yourself to the electricity charged area with the grappling beam, pretty much killing Dragon immediately. There isn't really much to acknowledge besides Dragon's grotesque form, as the fight and surrounding context don't really have much to explore besides very little basic analysis. A confrontation in the making since the beginning of the game. The lead up to it, traversing through the draconic castle-like area, sets up a perfect tone for the eventual fight. The music also helps maximize this tension that finally climaxes upon entering the boss's room. The vertically long room is quiet, and then an eye pops up from the darkness, the famed space pirate himself. Ridley. As it appears from the bottom, preventing you from using that space as protection, and Ridley himself is by far the most dangerous force to be encountered in the game. He's incredibly fast, shooting fire blasts, swiping or stabbing with his tail, and grabbing with his claws where he can bring you all the way to the top of the room. While you shoot or bomb him like any other enemy, this fight can last for a while. And the entire time, it's an engaging, intense confrontation that gets more and more dire with Ridley's unrelenting strength. But Samus will succeed. Now that the four bosses have been defeated, the statue quickly seeps into the ground, opening up the area down below. The end game awaits. Torian is the final area. There are two save points, the second of which is located past a point of no return. So saving there means you can't return to the rest of Zed. This area is filled with long vertical rooms and what makes these rooms particularly stand out and dangerous is the appearance of the infamous Metroids who will siphon your health, but luckily can be frozen and then destroyed with a super missile or maybe five missiles. They can be a very powerful force against you if you're not careful. As you move through the area, you'll eventually be stuck and an invincible enemy will move toward you. 
before being absorbed to death by a giant Metroid. And then it tries to do the same to Samus. Silence. After Samus is almost killed outright. It then runs away as Samus continues to move forward. Luckily, the next room gives you access to healing and missile refill. But afterwards you reach some mechanical rooms that eventually leads you into the very dangerous area where Mother Brain resides. Glowing rings are sent at you from various directions, so not taking damage is an extremely difficult task, especially since you must shoot barriers to be able to move forward. But finally you come face to face with Mother Brain. She's trapped in her canister, so firing at her grotesque form isn't too much of a challenge, besides avoiding the rings. Eventually the machines attached to her explode, and she loses her lively color. She's died. The true fight against Mother Brain starts now. The music blares and screeches, setting a horrifying tone for what's to come. The head is the one weak spot, so aim all shines there. She'll move around and fire her own mix of attacks, aiming high and low. Eventually though, she'll charge up and blast you with a destructive rainbow wave, preventing you from moving and even lifting you into the air. The fight might just be over, but before it can deliver the final blow, the metric from earlier saves the day. The baby Samus had kept alive has transformed into a super Metroid. After absorbing the power from Mother Brain, the Metroid bestows it onto Samus alongside restoring health but unfortunately at the cost of its own life. With this newfound power, Samus defeats Mother Brain. The victory is short lived however, as now Planet Zebes is set to explode in 3 minutes. Once again, tension ramps up as Samus must quickly escape, destroying obstacles in her path with her rainbow colored powers. Before she leaves upon reaching the surface, she heads down through the morph ball path from her way earlier and sets free the trapped creatures who had remained on the planet who quickly make their own escape. Samus then makes it to her own ship and escapes the planet before it dramatically explodes as she flies away, reaching the end of Super Metroid. And that's the thrilling experience of Super Metroid. Plus how it works as a thriller to some extent. Hopefully I did an okay job. Super Metroid in every aspect of its design creates and maintains this kind of engaging tension between the player and what is happening on the screen. And I think the best way to understand and feel that tension and kind of understand everything in the video is through playing the game itself, which I and many others absolutely recommend. So, go do that! And thank you so much for watching.